All right, welcome back. Uh, so we completed chapter 12. Uh, so even as we are engaging with people in our ministries and uh, wherever we are, whatever we're going to do, plans ahead, uh, keep these guidelines in mind uh, so that you can you know, just use it and try to reach out to as many people as you can. Now, let's get into chapter 13. Chapter 13 is the seven mountain assignment, right? the seven mountain assignment. Now, uh, the urban church must influence and impact the influencers and decision makers of our city and our nation and across the world. Right? Now, let's read about this seven mountain assignment. Where did it come from? How did this whole uh, theory or this uh, learning, uh, where did it come from, right? 1975, Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade and Lauren Cunningham, founder of Youth with the Mission, uh, met together. God simultaneously gave each of these change agents a message to give the other. And that message was that if we are to impact any nation for Jesus Christ, then we have to affect seven spheres or seven mountains or seven pillars of society, right? Now, we're using, remember, we're using the word seven mountains, seven spheres, or seven pillars just for communication, right? You can name it anything, seven segments, seven areas, seven groups, seven societies of our nation, anything. So let's look at each of them. First one, family, institution that is set up by God. If we want to impact families, we must learn how to minister to families. If we want to impact religion, even people including the church and, uh, and, the pe and people from outside of our faith, we need to be able to learn and understand. And this is where uh, uh, you know, apologetics will come in, right? to be ready to give a defense for the hope that is within you. Uh, then education, of course, education uh, touches a large percentage of society. So you've got schools, colleges, universities, academies, training centers, education, I would say at least a good 70% of, uh, of society. Then you've got media, uh, all forms of public communication. So if we want to uh, minister to people, how can we use media? Print, electronic, newspaper, TV, internet. Uh, we use all of these tools uh, to reach out the gospel. Arts and entertainment. Arts, entertainment, sports, all forms of celebration within that culture. Now, uh, it's it's nice to see. You know, I was reading this article on. Uh, uh, I forget where which uh, uh, agency, news agency, but. Uh, I was reading this article, and the article talked about the Olympics that was recently happening and how they made a mockery out of uh, the faith of uh, for Christians, and Christians were hurt. Um, but the article, one of you know, many of them, you know, openly, especially in twenty four Olympics, many of them openly, you know, declared who Jesus is in their lives, stood for the purpose of, uh, you know, stood for their faith and all of that. Uh, but there was this one, I think it was a woman, one uh, one of them, uh, and she had one gold, right? And she also knew how to, you know, uh, speak sign language, right? So in the interview, they are asking her, you know, uh, you got gold, so they're just asking her, and she's sign with sign language. She's she decided not to speak, but with sign language, she said, you know, she basically shared the whole gospel, saying, "This, uh, you know, I'm a sinner. This is what happened. Without Jesus, we are nothing, and this, uh, my life belongs to Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, give your life to Him. He'll change your life. He'll forgive you." The whole gospel she shared in. Sign language. Now, there were millions of people who were deaf, right? Who were watching the Paris Olympics. 
And it is said that many people seeing that put their faith in Christ. Can you believe that? Can you think of that? She did sign language, shared the gospel. There were people who were mute and deaf, who were watching it at their homes. Something stirred their heart and they believed in Jesus. So arts and entertainment is definitely a form. And I, I know of many very, very good athletes uh, across the world who are good believers and they are at the prime, at the best in what they're doing. But they stand for Jesus Christ. Now, what a testimony that is, right? Uh, so yes, arts and entertainment is definitely a form. Then you got business, innovation, science and technology. Uh, uh, production, sales, and service. So you tap in there. Government, the judicial system, the legislative system, and the executive uh, system. So these seven spheres, again, can be subdivided into many groups. But what we are saying is these, these are the places that, as believers, as, as a church, we must be able to tap into an impact. Believers in the local church, you and I, must be equipped to impact these places. Now, if I don't know how to, for example, if I don't know how to give a defense to another person from another faith, that means, you know, I'm not going into an argument, but I must be able to give a defense. Hey, why do you believe in Jesus? Say I'm talking to 10 people in my office, in the corporate sector, and all 10 of them are from three different faiths. So I'm talking to them. I must be willing. They ask me, hey, why do you go to church on Sundays? I must be in a place to be equipped enough to give a defense for the hope that is within me. That's what Peter is saying. Peter is trying to say, hey, there are people who will come and ask you why you believe in Jesus. Be ready to give an apology. Be ready to give a defense for the hope that is within you. So yes, we do that. Very important. We we are we equip ourselves. We equip people to do it. Right uh, uh, now, as we equip people, let's consider certain things when it comes to equipping people. Right. Number one, challenge. We are to preach the gospel and to disciple every nation entire nation how do we how do that's a challenge right how do we reach out to the entire nation or to the nations it's a big 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 task now how do we transform culture if you see uh, uh, you know culture has come in from years it's just been coming from generation to generation to generation to generation. That's the culture. If you open to your Bibles, when you look at the Old Testament, all the way till Malachi, the Israelites were doing whatever they felt like doing. They were following the commandments of God. They were Some of them were not. Some of them were, uh, but uh, they would do these offerings. But in that blank page, 400 years of silence. No prophetic word. Uh, for John the Baptist, when he came in, it was very difficult for him to break through the hearts and lives of people there because it was culture. You go. Yeah, so Prince, just make sure you don't, don't do that again, please. OK, so yeah, so be able to prepare, be able to prepare people to, be, to minister and to share uh, in the right way. Now, how do we transform culture, model biblical principles? Teach them to observe the things we have commanded. We bring in the principles of the Bible, all that Jesus taught we teach it, right? So culture doesn't change. 
sorry, culture keeps changing. The Bible, the word of God doesn't change. Then bring in biblical principles of integrity, excellence, kindness, justice, treating people fairly. Now, you know, let me share this. It's easy for us to say this. You may think, you know, us it's easy to say, but how will we impact, you know, thousands of people just by this? We we will be able to. Uh, it's a process. Right? Uh, let God work through his process. We do our part, right? We model it, we teach it, we coach people, we train people, we let our light shine by our good works. Secondly, we let our light shine by our good works. Let's read Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16. Can we read that, please? Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Matthew 5, 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth. For if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, but to be thrown out and trampled under by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under, the, under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light be shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Yeah. Right. So basically, it's be your light, be your salt wherever you are, that when people see you, they will glorify the Father in heaven. Right. Uh, thirdly, engaging in spiritual transformation. Remember, we talked about this uh, earlier on, right? Engaging in spiritual transformation, you find out what is happening in that part of your city or the state or the nation, and you pray. You engage in spiritual transformation. Uh, culture is shaped by spiritual influences that surround it. So we can cast down wrong mindsets, ideologies. Think of this. Uh, it may not be a right example, but something that really ministered to me. William Carey came all the way to India from another country. And when he saw the atrocities that were happening with the people in India, the Sati movement, where when a, when a, when a man died, the, husband, the wife was thrown into fire. And because her life was not worthy enough to be lived, because she doesn't have a husband now. William Carey came in, brought biblical principles, brought biblical values. He knew that this is the work of the devil, and he fought for this right of abolishing the Sati movement, and he won the case. Can you think of it? From generation to generation, it had been passed on for years. It was a common thing in our nation. It was not like, oh, you know, even the women were ready for it. The women knew if my husband dies, I have to jump into the fire. I have to be killed also because there's no point of living. So it was not like the women didn't know. But when William Carey saw this, he said, this is the enemy blinding the people. And just and this is the work of the enemy. So I have to do something. He began to pray spiritual transformation, um, especially it all started off near Orissa. And then he was able to abolish the Sati movement. Now, is it possible for us to make changes in the society? Yes. With all the tools and all the things that we have now, communications that we have now, the facilities that we have now. Imagine William Carey, those days, probably had to write a letter, go to the court, say, see, I want to abolish. Then they would say, come after some time. Or, you know, and that would being a foreigner, why are you worried about these Indians? Uh, this is a culture that has been we've been following for hundreds and thousands of years. From where you know, why are you coming and trying to change these? But he changed it. He engaged in spiritual transformation. He brought the gospel to people. People understood. People became believers. He planted schools, colleges. He transformed the nation. You know, I uh, I want to encourage you as Bible college students. You must read about the life of David Livingston. You must read it. 
it is uh, one of the most powerful stories of transformation that you can read of. Henry M. Stanley writes two volumes, the, the biography of Living, Livingston of Africa, written by Henry M. Stanley. Beautiful, beautiful biography, most powerful one. And the way he went about this transforming lives, he transformed the entire nation of Africa. One man was able to do that. No media, no television, no newspapers, nothing. One man. When you read all, all this, it is not that God cannot do it. God can do it. Now, I'm not saying that you know we must become like David Livingston and, all, and William Carey and leave everything and go. No. Wherever we are, we can do our part. One heart at a time. Right? Uh, we can take kingdom authority, prayer, demonstrate the supernatural wherever we are. Right? It could be even in our neighborhood. Demonstrate. In our colleges, demonstrate the supernatural. Workplaces, demonstrate the supernatural. Be wise on how you do it, but demonstrate. Just because we are in the office doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is on break. No, he's not. He's there. Right? So we, we, uh, we go about removing those, uh, breaking the strongholds of the enemy and asking God to remove the blindness from people's minds and people's eyes. Right? So these are uh, three ways that we can you know, engage. One is uh, mortal biblical principles. Two is we let our light shine so people will see and uh, uh, praise God for our good works. Three is engage in spiritual transformation. So what is the, what, how, how can you and I be prepared? If we need to go and impact the entire city or a state or a nation, how can we be prepared as individuals? Just a few points here. Three points. One, heart preparation. Our heart needs to be ready to do what God has called us to do. I can give you plenty of examples from church history. Guard against what are our desires? Why are we doing what we're doing? Guard against lusts of money, power, influence, appetite. Keep your desires pure. Let it, be, let it be so that everything that I do is to glorify God, to please God, to build God's kingdom, to advance uh, against the gates of hell. That's the motive. Prepare your heart. Guard against motivations, meaning why am I doing what I'm doing? Right? The decisions, the choices, the, the plans that I have, why am I doing it? Guard your motives. Remember, Jesus writes to the Pharisees, he writes and he's talking to the disciples. He says, Leave those Pharisees alone. They are blind men leading the blind. Were they blind? They were not blind. But Jesus is saying they were blind men leading the blind. Why? Because their heart motivations is completely wrong. They stand in the street corners and they pray so that whoever is passing by will look at them. Oh, see this Pharisee is praying. Oh, such a holy man. You know, we have to go about going and working and doing everything. But they are praying for us. So we have to bless them. We have to give to them. No. Guard your motivations. Jesus says, don't be like those hypocrites who, who pray in the street corner just so that people can watch them and they get a good name. Guard your motives. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Maintain godly motivations. Thirdly, guard your character. Character determines decisions. And I always, always say this. Gifts, skills, and our talents will take us up the ladder, take us to a place of positions. But it is our character that can keep us there. We know of many, many, many world leaders, both in the secular system and in the church, who have gone up the ladder, gained fame, popularity, but because of one thing, 
the character has failed and they've fallen down. Therefore, we must guard our character, conform ourselves to God's standards, integrity, honesty, purity, excellence, compassion, justice, you know, you know uh, uh, learning to love one another, learning to forgive one another, guard our character, right? So these are things. In heart preparation, if, firstly, if I want to impact people around me, I need to have a right heart. Remember, the Bible says God is the discerner of our hearts. He knows what's happening in our heart. Have you ever thought of it? I'm sure you have. But why did God say, David is a man after my own heart? If God saw his heart. There was something about him. He had like a childlike heart. This little shepherd boy, I chose him. Made a lot of mistakes. Right? But his heart is right. He's not like Saul, trying to find out, you know, trying to do, trying to go by different means, you know, to kill people, to... He's not jealous. David was... David is not jealous. It's like, you know, God saying, David is not jealous. He may have done something wrong, but he's not jealous. David is not proud of his position. He may be the king of Israel, but he's not proud. How do we know that? When Nathan came and corrected him, what did he say? I have sinned. He put on sackcloth ashes. He tore his clothes. He began to fast. He didn't need to do that. Okay. Now, David is he's, he's, a, he's a king of Israel. He's got like the highest position. And this prophet comes up to him. You know what? You've done this wrong. You know what David could have said? Okay. There's a way to tell this. Now I'm upset with you. Take him. Be done with him, you know. End his life. Because he didn't talk to the king in the right way. Now, I may have done wrong, but there's a way to tell me. Why did you, how can you dare come and speak to me like that? Did he say that? Right. So the thing with David, his heart was right. And I believe if God had told him, David, you give this throne to, example, right? Give this throne to Jonathan. You step down from being king. He would have given it gladly. Because I feel that David's heart was not on that throne. His heart was making sure that he is living right before God. And if there are things in his life he had to change, he would have changed it. And he did change it. Right? So guard your motivations. Guard your desires. See, the enemy can bring in desires. The enemy can bring in motivations. The enemy can, will find a way to break you. He may, he may, he chooses, he, he tries to find those areas of our weakness and he targets those areas. That's why Ephesians 6, Paul writes and he says, listen, put on the armor of God. Put on the breastplate of righteousness that can protect you. Protect your heart, protect your organs, protect everything in you. The breastplate, that you will have a right standing before God. That even if you, you know, oh, if anything happens, you stand before God, you'll have a clear heart, a clear conscience. That's a beautiful place to be in. Nothing to hide. Guard your motivations, guard your character. Right? Now, these, especially character, remember, character is built over time. God gives us a certain nature, right? Our certain gifts and talents. And our character is something that we build. I can choose to have a good character, right? Or I can choose to do things in a bad way and walk in ungodly character. I can choose it. It's my choice. Elijah and Elisha. Elisha chose to stick with Elijah. No, I'm not going to let you go. What do you need? Double portion of your anointing. Done. If you see me going, you'll get it. Same thing, Elisha and Gehazi. Gehazi said, no, there was money in stake. Raman comes and says, and since now you've healed me of leprosy, Elisha, you can take whatever money you want, gold, silver, everything. What do you want to take? Elisha says, you can take your money and go back. 
we don't need anything. Gehazi says, he saw all of it and he says, you know, there are some people who are uh, training to be prophets. They may need some money. Can I take some? The man says, take what you want. He takes, he comes, he puts it in his room, comes back to Elisha. Elisha says, where were you? Now think of this. He didn't. He looked at money and and the offer of gold and silver more important to what God called him for. He could have been the next greatest prophet after Elisha, but he didn't because of this. What he did. So we need to guard. Maybe Gehazi would have had Elijah. Elisha got Geh Elijah's double anointing. Gehazi could have got Elisha's double anointing, and he could have been the next greatest prophet in the nation of Israel. But he chose this, and so he was disqualified from what God, uh, from from what uh, you know. If he was in, he was with Elisha. Nothing. Would have, God would have definitely chosen him, but he chose the wrong way. So, guard our character, guard our decisions, the things that we do. Be very careful. Two. The first, first way of preparing is heart preparation. Two, spiritual preparation. Equip ourselves. Again, this is the anointing of the Holy Spirit uh, for, and faith that births creativity, demonstrate wisdom, prophetic, supernatural signs and wonders, basically manifesting the gifts of the Holy Spirit, walking in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. For that, you and I need to prepare. Go back to God's word. Read God's word. Spend time in prayer. Ask God to teach us. Ask God to minister to us, right? And and then when we prepared in this in the private, you come out and you stand. You know, you, you in public, God begins to stand with you. God begins to minister to you and through you, right? So spiritual preparation is a key in terms of being able to minister the gospel. Thirdly, natural preparations, right? Uh, develop the skills of, in, uh, uh, and capabilities. Now, for example, if I want to uh, minister to somebody who is uh, in sound and setup or, or music, so I need to learn about it, develop the skill so that I'd be able to uh, you know, be on par with that person, be able to talk to that person. Right? Uh, so whatever area of influence. Uh, I'm not saying take up a three-year course and learn about it. Just learn simple things that you can engage with that person with. Right? And fourthly is positioning. Right? Uh, we must be positioned to influence. Look at this. God can position you in one or more ways as a transformer or a leader like Joseph and Daniel. Joseph was positioned to be in Egypt. And he became second in command. Daniel was positioned to be in Babylon. He again became uh, the governor of uh, three kings, three kingdoms. He then you have an influencer, Esther. He influenced. She influenced. Naaman's maid, right? Remember that little girl who said, "Naaman's with leprosy," but she said, "Master, I know a prophet." He in in Israel, his name is Elisha. You go to him, he will heal you of your leprosy. Now, the best thing is, have you ever thought of this? Naaman has not healed anyone before, he's not healed anyone of leprosy. But here, uh, sorry, Naaman, uh, uh, Elisha has, has not healed anyone before. But here, the little girl knew that if God wants to, God can do it. She influenced Naaman, the commander, to go to Elisha, right? an influencer. An accessor, Nehemiah. Nehemiah had access to the king. Right? The walls, the gates are burned, the walls are broken down. He had access to the king. He was able to go and talk to the king and, uh, and you know, get whatever he needed to get done. Then a cross pollinator, meaning like Moses or Paul, a preacher to those in authority. Moses stood in front of Pharaoh and said, Let my people go. Paul stood in front of many, many great leaders. He stood in front of Agrippa. He stood in front of uh, uh, 
you know, Felix, uh, the Roman leaders, he stood in front of them, right? Caesar's palace, he stood in front of Caesar and began to preach the gospel in all these three places, right? Um, and a trendsetter or a catalyst at any level. So these are certain ways that we can really, uh, you know, put our foot into areas that where God wants us to be. Now you find your niche, meaning you find a place where God wants you to be. So if you feel it's youth, just go in there, try to find out, learn, study, grow, develop the ability to minister to youth. If you, if you feel it's young couples, you do that. If it's women or if it's only men, uh, whatever area of influence, if it's teens, if it's children, you find out what area it is, you develop yourself, grow, and then you just apply these principles. I believe that God can use us. We are the salt. Amen? Right? So uh, God will use us. God can use us to minister to people. Right? Any questions before uh, we close for today? Any questions? OK. So now questions. Uh, what we'll do is we'll close. Uh, yes, Nina, you have a question? Uh, yes, Pastor. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Um, so uh, actually, it was uh, in the previous part of the uh, lesson before the Seven Mountains, mm -hmm. when you mentioned about uh, stepping out uh, to be able to do something. I mean, and the, one of the examples that you gave was about Jesus, how he uh, met up with the Samaritan woman, and he knew. So uh, to further understand that, I was uh, like, suppose God has called you in, into a specific area, and you're kind of involved in that along that line you are doing that but is it uh i mean would it be that we need to be encouraged to really step out into certain intentionally that or or you know do we need to pray about it i mean is there any other area that i can be involved in and uh, so do we need to step out intentionally obviously after prayer i i would presume but do we need to do that is what I just wanted to know. Yeah, so that's a very good question. Let me answer this both practically and put in a little spiritual aspect as well. Uh, our gifts and our grace go hand in hand. So when, when God is ministering to you, so for example, God may say, okay, Nina, example, right? Um, Oh, Nina, God may say, Nina, you, I want you to minister to women who have gone through, uh, you know, uh, who are widows, for example, right? Widows who have gone through sudden loss in their in their families. They could be young widows, middle aged, even older widows. Now, God has put that in your heart. Now you've been praying about it, and every time you pray, you just sense that, right? Uh, you may get a word. You may you may just have this feeling inside you. Now remember, the Holy Spirit speaks through our senses, right? So what what we can do at this time is you pray and you ask God, God. Now, firstly, I need to prepare myself. So how do I speak to widows right now? They are going through pain. They may be feeling lonely, right? Uh, many of them have lost their loved ones. Maybe all of a sudden. Right? It's a sudden death in the family and uh, you know they, everything was going good in their life. Suddenly there was a death. So how do I minister to them? So you should be able to read, uh, prob you know, of course, a lot of prayer and reading of the word of God. But you must also be able to read other you know, stories and try to put yourself in their place. Try to understand what they are going through. And then when you... You ask God, in the meanwhile, you're preparing yourself, but you're also asking God, God, open doors for me to step into that field. Now, the problem is sometimes we may feel that, hey, no door is opening, so maybe this is not God's will for my life. No. Right? Uh, if, if God has put that in your heart, he will eventually open the right door. But in the meanwhile, we need to prepare ourselves. Right? He will definitely open a door. He may just start off by giving you somebody, you know, getting you connected with somebody who is maybe just a neighbor, right? Uh, uh, something very small. But 
uh, we need to ensure that we are you know preparing ourselves for what god has put in our heart right if you look at uh, uh, nina i hope i answered your question uh, yes yes thank you first yes yeah. so in the meanwhile you may also have so you're preparing okay widows i'm going to speak to widows but in the meanwhile now you are attending a church right you're attending you're part of a church you're part of a cell group or all of this now you have also a heart for young girls Right, no, right. Young girls are going through so much of problems, and uh, you know, uh, many of them are uh, you know confused in life. So I want to also minister to them. Now, your heart is desires for ministering to widows, also young girls, or it could be young couples who are going through a tough time, and now you know you've gone through, uh, you know, being married, and you you've gone through that whole. Uh, season of being married, raising up children, and so you also want to minister to young people, help them to understand how to raise up children. So now you have two or three desires in your heart. So it's not wrong. Right? You can okay. So young people, I need to know how to minister there. So let me also prepare there. So it's not like okay. So now I'm getting the desire for young people. So uh, widows, I'll put it away. No. God can put two or three or more desires in your heart. Best example, look at the Apostle Paul. God, the Lord Jesus says, I have made you a light to the Gentiles. But wherever he went in his missionary journeys, he went first to the Jews. He went first to the synagogues and began to preach there. But God had made him a light to the Gentiles. Right? So, so, so you understand like that the whole calling of God. Uh, he puts different desires in our different stirrings in our heart, and then we work accordingly to it. Right, anything else? Uh, the question. Okay, so let's close, uh, and then we'll pick up from the next chapter. That is chapter fifteen or chapter fourteen. Yes, chapter fourteen, growth and consolidation. We'll pick it up from. Uh, next class. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for being with us, Lord, and we thank you for teaching us today. Even as you have given us the authority, you have given us the commission, Lord, to go and be salt and light. Lord, we pray that whichever sphere of influence that you have placed us in, that you will enable us, you will equip us by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you will open doors for us, O God, that each one of us will be the salt and light wherever we go and in whatever we do. Guard our hearts, help us to guard ourselves, uh, help us to build on good character, on biblical principles, so that the ministry and everything that you're causing us to do, Lord, will bear fruit in our lives and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everyone. I'll see you next week. God bless.